I've spoken to, to people who, you know, they wanted to devote their lives to go into science, to research stuff, to make people's lives better. And they left and they became campaigners, actually, because they said what I realized was it didn't matter how important the research I was doing was. All that mattered is, does a big corporation think they're going to make a lot of money out of this? There's one reading of COVID, which is it confirmed the importance of big pharmaceutical companies that without those companies so frequently derided and bashed by the likes of me and the rest of us at Navarra Media, we would have been in big trouble. And the fact we had vaccines as quickly as we did to COVID-19 reflected that in fact, they know a lot more about how to do this than the rest of us. We should just shut up basically. But what if that was in fact a marketing coup? What if that interpretation of the last several years was spin? and a success of public relations. What if Big Pharma, more than just failing to uphold the levels of innovation we might expect, more than just failing to see accelerating improvements in progress, they're actually holding innovation back and suppressing access to life-saving medicines for some of the poorest people in the world. Well, that's the contention of today's guest. Nick Dearden is the director of Global Justice Now and the author of a new book, Pharmanomics. Nick Dearden, welcome to Downstream. Thank you. Before we talk about your book, tell our listeners, our viewers, who you are. Why are we talking to you? What's your, what's your profile? Why are you an authority on the issue of development, healthcare, the global south? So I work at an organization called Global Justice Now. We're a campaign organization. We work in solidarity with groups um, from the global south. And for the last six years, we've been working on reform of the pharmaceutical sector. Um, and we happen to be working on it when a major pandemic broke out, um, which kind of highlighted a lot of the stuff that we'd been talking about. So we're going to be using the words big pharma a lot during, the, a lot during this interview. Now, people hear big all the time. They hear big tech, I don't know, you know, big this, big that. I, I saw uh, Tom Harwood the other day talk about um, the RSPB being an impediment to growth. I said, you can call it big bird. Uh, so often people use this word big something before something they, they don't like or they disparage. What does big pharma mean? Where does it come from this term? So essentially, I mean, it refers, yes, to a bunch of gigantic um, corporations that um, produce medicines and many of them you know you'll know the names so Pfizer, AstraZeneca, GlaxoSmithKline, um, AbbVie um, but I think it, it's a useful term in that yeah it denotes something about the system the ecosystem that those corporations exist within um, they are actual monopolies in many cases I mean they live off the monopoly rights that they get to produce drugs um, and that's what makes them um, very very wealthy it also means that they don't exactly compete against each other. They're not really competing against each other in terms of the drugs they're selling because they're all different drugs. They're kind of competing against each other for investments, like many other parts of the economy are. Um, but what it means is they have a, you know, they have a, a bit of groupthink. Um, they have a, um, a, a, they're more collaborative in the way they approach some of the big economic questions and fight for their interests in the economy. Are there any similar sort of economic sectors? Because it's interesting you say that they don't make the same thing. So, for instance. We can say that the car industry is competitive because you have a choice for Volkswagen or a BMW or a whatever. Whereas, like you say, the whole point of these companies is they specialize in making different different uh, therapies or treatments. So is, is there any other sector that works like this, really? I mean, look, I, I would say in many ways they are symbolic of where our economy has gone over the last 40 years. In that, as I'm sure we're going to talk about, they're highly financialized corporations, highly monopolistic corporations. Um, and, and actually that those things affect the economy as a whole. But I do think that they are um, forerunners. They're in the kind of vanguard of that precisely because of the nature of what they make. It made it easier for them to financialize because the very nature of their uh, activity, their economic activity is monopolistic. Mm. You've got a great quote here about Pfizer, one of the central guys of um, Big Pharma, one of the central companies. One US official described the Pfizer vaccine as the biggest marketing coup in the history of American pharmaceuticals. Can you unpack that? Yeah. So what he was saying is we're here in the middle of a pandemic. Everybody in the world knows this term Pfizer's vaccine, but it's not Pfizer's vaccine. Pfizer didn't create this vaccine. And actually, it's the same for all the vaccines. I mean, Moderna didn't create his vaccine. AstraZeneca didn't create its vaccine. But we, we term them Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca vaccines. Um, and that is really uh, symptomatic of how this industry works. 
Um, and it goes to the heart of what I want to expose in this book, really, which is we think these gigantic corporations make the medicines that keep us healthy um, or that we need to protect us um, in times of pandemic. Um, and yeah, OK, they profiteer from them. They make a lot of money from them. But at least they're doing the basics. It's not true. They don't, by and large, produce medicines anymore. They don't invent medicines anymore. They buy up the intellectual property to medicines and then they extract whatever they can from that intellectual property. So in many ways, they behave more like hedge funds um, than medical research companies. So, so why Pfizer in particular? So that, that's the line, right? The biggest marketing coup in the history of American pharmaceuticals. Why, why is Pfizer particularly bad in, in this regard? And, and again, unpack that. So if Pfizer didn't make this vaccine, who did? So the vaccine was made, um, if, if anybody made it, the va vaccine was made by a company called BioNTech, uh, which is a German company who got um, quite a bit of public money. But of course, you know, like anything in medicine, like anything in science, you're standing on the shoulder of giants all the time. So you can't really say anybody ever made one single medicine. But actually, Pfizer didn't come anywhere close to making this medicine. And, if, and as I say, if anybody, if anybody, if, the, if it can be laid at the door of anybody, it's, it's BioNTech in the same way AstraZeneca was made by Oxford University, if it was made by you know, any, any individual unit. I think Pfizer is a particularly rapacious example of Big Pharma. It's kind of Big Pharma at its worst um, in many ways. Um, Pfizer doesn't have very many scruples about the way that it behaves. So in the pandemic, it stands accused of, of, of some really in incredible behavior, including a member of its board going out and rubbishing um, a competitor vaccine, AstraZeneca's vaccine, you know, basically just making stuff up about it um, in, in order to deter um, governments from buying it, or so the theory goes, stands accused of um, uh, basically having conversations with COVAX, which was supposed to be the body that um, was going to a bit, be a bit fairer about how uh, it distributed vaccines around the world, kind of leading them on, basically, in order to um, increase the price that governments were able to pay elsewhere. The reason that that member of the American administration was so angry about Pfizer is Pfizer apparently initially went to the American government and tried to charge them $120 a dose. Um, for the vaccine. Wow. $120 uh, a dose. How much does it cost to, to fabricate? So Pfizer itself claims the cost of production is about $5. Um, we've had scientists who say you could make it for a dollar. $120. And that's the most powerful country in the world, right? That's the one with right. the most leverage. And that is what they're charging now. I mean, they said in their last shareholder meeting, that's what they're going to be charging. And that's interesting, right? Because you kind of think, okay, your argument for charging this amount of money is it's cost a lot to make that vaccine, if not to actually produce the thing, to, to do all the research and so on. Of course, I argue that they didn't do that um, research. But nonetheless, there's an argument out there. That's why they charge so much money. Why on earth does the price go up by five times after it's already been on the market for three years? It doesn't make any sense. And so effectively, they're charging whatever the market will bear because they're monopolists. Mm, and that thing about BioNTech is really interesting as well, because BioNTech... I'm sure some people listening, watching this are familiar with, you know, the, the Turkish immigrant success story, et cetera, et cetera. What they won't know generally is that BioNTech, I think, received more than $700 million worth of public funds from the German government. Um, and so if we're saying if anybody's responsible for this vaccine, of course, many people, are, like you say, the German taxpayer is more responsible for it than, than Pfizer executives. Um, was that a live debate in Germany at the time? Obviously, because you had this whole vaccine nationalism and then there's this vaccine developed by German nationals with German public funds and all of the gains are really going to an American multinational. Yeah. Um, to some degree, yeah. It, it became an issue when I think Trump tried to buy BioNTech um, early in the pandemic. That, that became an issue and a kind of intu uh, an issue of national interest. Um, the, 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 the issue of patents and intellectual property, not so much in Germany. I mean, it was there a bit, but it, it wasn't as big as it was here. And it certainly wasn't as big as it was in the US and other parts of the world. And that's interesting. And I, and I posit maybe that's because actually it was, I mean, in some ways, Germany started the pharmaceutical industry um, at the beginning of the 20th century. Some of the first pharmaceutical companies, they are German companies. They were making dye stuffs um, and they worked out, you know, the same chemical processes that allow you know, colors to attach to fabrics um, can also help um, in terms of making medicines. Um, and they patented medicines at a time when nobody else in the world really did. You know, when even the American Pharmaceutical Association said you can't patent medicines. Um, so I wonder whether there's something very deep there um, around an, accepting, an acceptance of, of, of the fact that this stuff carries monopolies on it. The history thing is really interesting because that's an aside in the book. Uh, but it's fascinating that even, you know, the British 
British civil society, the British political class, even to the 30s, 40s, had real misgivings around the application of patents to healthcare products. Can you, can you unpack that a yeah, bit? absolutely. I mean, they just thought it was unethical. They just thought, how on earth can you patent stuff, which is life and death? How can you patent um, public interest science in this way? And there was an understanding, you know, this stuff involves massive amounts of public time and money. The thing that really changed their mind was antibiotics, because, because they didn't patent antibiotics, but they had, you know, there was, a, there was a belief in Britain that antibiotics came from Britain. I mean, actually, again, it, you know, it's a bit more complicated than that. But of course, we all know the stories about um, penicillin um, bit, uh, and the way that it was um, uh, discovered. Um, so, you know, but, but actually, Britain, Britain didn't put any patents on. Um, it was then all bought up by American multinationals who sold it back to us for an absolute fortune. Um, and Harold Wilson's government ended up overriding some of the patents, actually, and, um, and, and importing it from Italy, where they, they still weren't, they were producing generics. They still didn't have the same patent regime for medicines. Um, so, but, you know, it kind of, it kind of worried them. Um, that actually this is the way the world's going. We're going to have to start thinking differently about this. And of course, the pharmaceutical industry was, um, was, was, was very much in favour of that move. The thing about Wilson as well, again, super interesting for an audience who's you know, obviously familiar with some of the debates around COVID, access to vaccines, etc., Global South North debates on public health care. This was a very live debate in a British policy context, like you say, as recently as the 1960s. So, so what happened then with Wilson and, and, and these patents on certain pharmaceutical products? So it's essentially, and it's still a, it's still a problem today. I, I mean, essentially, you know, we don't feel exactly about the pharmaceutical companies like you would feel if you were in America, because we don't pay the price that these pharmaceutical companies are charging. I mean, we are protected and insulated by our national health system. Um, but the national health system pays for these drugs, and it costs them a lot of money. Um, and and in, the, in, in the 60s and 70s, you know, there were certain drugs, including antibiotics, later Valium, um, that were costing an absolute fortune to the National Health Service. So someone like Wilson coming in and trying to make, you know, trying to make sure this is sustainable into the future, um, this was a real problem. Um, and so how do you begin to combat their powers? And there were, there were investigations. There was a parliamentary investigation led by uh, Lord Sainsbury. At the time, there was another one um, in the US um, led by Senator Calvervan, um, and, and they essentially said, you know, this stuff shouldn't be patented in this way. I mean, you can have short patents, but you should be able to make your money back in you know, three years, um, and then it's off brand. I mean, they also said you shouldn't be able to use... Uh, brand names. I mean, this was a wonderful invention of the of the pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry that essentially um, you either had to use the brand name or to describe the underlying medicine, you had to use this kind of Latin name that nobody can pronounce. And you're never going to walk into a chemist and ask for this thing. You're always going to ask for the brand name. So it was another thing that they, you know, and they were saying you, you shouldn't be allowed to do this. Um, so there was a massive case for reform. And, and, and I would argue, historically speaking, that was because it was, it was in the post-war period where we really redeveloped our relationship to drugs and medicines as, as citizens in society. Uh, I mean, up to that point, healthcare had been very expensive. Medicines had been a lot more hit and miss. And then there was this wave of medical discoveries, antibiotics, um, steroids, uh, tranquilizers, um, that um, became part of our life and we developed a relationship with in a way that we hadn't had before. And at that point, of course, it was very good for the pharmaceutical industry, but people also started questioning, how is this industry regulated? Why are these things so expensive? Just so crazy. The idea now that a Labour prime minister would come in and, you know, Wilson is venerated by people who, if a a Labour PM did that today, they would say, that's outrageous, it's unthinkable. There was that great clip, sort of to the tail end of the pandemic, when I think you had Matt Ford, who's a, you don't need to comment on anybody who's not here, it's not fair on, on, on them or you, but Matt Ford, who's like a sort of Labour supporting comedian, and somebody said something about, you know, well, actually, intellectual property rights need to really be examined wholesale with regards to this stuff. And he was, he was laughing in their face like they were morons. And you think, well, you're a Labour Party member. A Labour Prime Minister who won four elections broadly agreed with that statement. Absolutely. Yeah. And still, you know, people in the US do today, you know, in, you know, serious people um, in, in Congress and the Senate, not enough of them um, yet, but it's changing. So ab absolutely. And, and, and Wilson did some great speeches in the House of Commons, but on the pharmaceutical industry, you know, I mean, he just, he, he looked at their profit margins. He said, what, what other industry in this country makes these kind of profit margins? It's obscene. And, and they're making it, of course, in Britain's case, of public money. And that should be the thing that that, that, that I think should concern an incoming Labour government today. Like, who is paying for this? We're paying for it twice because we pay an awful lot in research and development, 
without which we wouldn't have any of these medicines in the first place. We then pay it again um, when, we, when the NHS is charged um, for medicines, which in many cases are absolutely astronomical. And right now, there's a real issue with the NHS, right? The cost of medicines are just spiralling. In recent years, yeah, it is. So it was so bad a few years ago um, that even the Tory, go even under a Tory government, they said um, we need to try and source generics wherever we can. Started buying loads more from India, um, and and the price therefore has gone down a bit. Uh, rather crazy that our our prime minister is currently trying to do a trade deal with India, um, which would, um, if they get their way, remove some of India's ability to bring generics um, uh, to to. Um, bring generics um, quickly enough onto the market. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Because, and, and I think this is a, and I think this is one of the reasons why the, what's happening with the pharmaceutical industry is unsustainable. Something has to change because medicines are getting more and more and more expensive. So that even very rich health services, you know, bulk at the price they're being charged. And oftentimes the NHS either won't provide it or will provide it on an extremely rationed basis. Because some new medicines, you know, you're talking about, Hundred thousand pounds for per patient for a course. Can you give an example of something that costs that much right now? Yeah, so uh, there's a drug called Humira, uh, made by Abvi. It, it deal it treats some um, Crohn's disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, kind of anti-inflammatory, um, pretty effective. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think they are, they have just brought generics on, but for a while they weren't providing it at all, um, and then it was highly highly rationed. Uh, the most expensive medicine in history. A hundred thousand pound a course. Wow. And Crohn's is a chronic disease, right? You have it for a really long time. Yeah, which is why the pharmaceuticals think this is a great medicine because that's, that's their gold, right? A chronic, a chronic disease that doesn't stop the disease, but it makes it livable with. And you've got to be on it. And do they overtly say that? I mean, because obviously that you could say, well, it's in their interest to behave like that. But do they overtly say that we are directing funding to chronic diseases because it makes more money? Yep. Uh, so, I mean, they both say it and, and you can see it. In, in, in what they do. So, you know, one of the problems that we had going into the pandemic is very few companies do vaccines anymore because vaccines aren't profitable enough. Uh, that doesn't mean vaccines don't make anything. I mean, you can make a healthy profit off a vaccine, but you can't make 100,000 a course. And of course, until the pandemic, we also thought most vaccines you have once in your life, right? We thought, I mean, the pandemic's changed our view about that somewhat. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that just wasn't worthwhile. So the, the number of companies making vaccines went down from like 26 to 4, um, I think, of the big multinational Western co uh, corporations. Just not profitable. Uh, where is that money going? Uh, well, the big one is cancer. Um, and uh, what they particularly like with cancer, of course, cancer isn't, isn't, isn't a chronic disease, um, but what they particularly like is, is making tweaks to drugs that can make cancer bearable, or extend your life by a short period of time. Um, because in that instance, of course, you know, a relative of somebody, you yourself in that situation, that, that's worth a hell of a lot to you. Um, whether it is the best use of research and development investment in the economy, as a, in Venice as a whole, is a very, very different question. Um, but yeah, sure. And, and, and also, yeah, the, the chronic diseases like, um, like Crohn's and so on that you need to be taking all the time, um, that's where huge amounts of money go. Um, almost, almost nothing, nothing at all, really, into into antibiotic discovery. Um, very, very little to nothing in terms of what might cause a future pandemic. Um, no money to be made in that kind of stuff. Um, so it warps, it perverts what medicines we are getting as a society. It's interesting you mentioned cancer. Obviously, that's one of the sort of quintessential age-related health conditions like heart disease, stroke, etc. The older you are, the more likely you are to have it. Unlike infection, um, and. Obviously, those have been the, 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 the conditions that have been the leading cause of death in the West since really the Second World War, since antibiotics go mainstream. And what's interesting with these is they kind of create this Ouroboros or, you know, this self-feeding feedback, which is to say, we focus on these drugs, they increase life expectancy marginally, the person gets older, and of course, because they get older, it increases the probability of getting all these other things. And the, the, the price goes up, the price goes up, you create more incentives for marginal improvements in life expectancy. And it just seems like a, a mechanism really to bankrupt societies with regards to how you do healthcare. I think that's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah, which is crazy, right? Uh, I mean, it doesn't make any sense from, from the point of view of, 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 of the rest of society. But yeah, I think one of the problems here is we've, we've, we've kind of, you know, so many politicians have swallowed the neoliberal myth 
that the market will provide if you provide them with enough incentives to make money off this kind of stuff. They, they've missed the big picture. Um, they've missed the fact that, that actually you know, there aren't incentives to make the kind of profits that, you're, that the pharmaceutical industry is used to now um, from making stuff which is suffered, you know, like infections that are kind of one-off or stuff that's suffered particularly by you know, poorer people in poorer countries around the world. I mean, there's just no money to be made in that. So all of the investment goes in. Yeah, diseases suffered by you know, essentially rich people or people in, in, in very rich countries in increasing numbers. Um, and um, the problem is there's no alternative. So because we swallow the neoliberal myth, because we believe the market should provide, society hasn't set up alternative means to produce this stuff. So we're stuck with a load of companies that we think are doing a job that they're not really doing. Um, and that's why I think this moment in time is so important, because I think we're getting to a point now where the unsustainability of that is becoming really obvious. And maybe COVID turbocharged it, um, but it was the writing was already on the wall, which is why you're I think, beginning to see some changes in, of all places, the United States, in terms of its attitude towards pharmaceuticals. Yeah, we'll talk about Joe Biden in a moment. I mean, I, and I think that does index onto the age-related aspects of it, where in countries with a median age, like the UK of 41, 42, all of a sudden, it becomes a major conversation. What got me thinking, actually, in this book was this area, because I thought, look, if somebody creates an innovation, now this is going to sound outlandish to a serious person like you, Nick, but if somebody creates an innovation where you could reverse aging, Right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, what would that that would that would mean a tremendous loss of value for the pharmaceutical industry because all of a sudden, all these treatments for age-related chronic conditions would no longer be a thing. Now I say that because it's a it's a theme in a book called Red Mars by Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson. But this this idea that you know what would be um, hugely useful to human welfare and, and utility is really at odds with where we're going on this stuff and, 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 and Big Pharma. That's one aspect of it. So the, the false incentives maybe means we're misallocating resources to address the big challenges, the healthcare challenges of the 21st century. Another one, which is perhaps, again, what a US audience is more familiar with, is OxyContin. So this is, you know, big incentives have really led to, to millions of Americans becoming hooked on opioids. So for a UK audience a bit less familiar with this story, what is the what is the the narrative behind OxyContin? Where did it come from? How did it become so mainstream? How did millions of Americans get legally hooked on painkillers? So OxyContin is 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 you know, it's essentially a type of heroin. Um, um, a very, very, very strong painkiller, um, which really should be used extremely sparingly. I mean, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't have any use, but it's it's end of life, you know, or, or very serious um, cancer uh, related pain. The problem is um, OxyContin um, was the property of a company called Purdue, um, which was started off by um, Sackler, um, the, the name that we uh, associate now with lots of art galleries and uh, you know he's a lot of philanthropic um, funding. But, th but this guy was a, was a marketing genius when it came to pharmaceuticals. I mean, he basically put Valium on the map. I mean, he was the guy, um, it, that wasn't his drug, but he did a marketing job on Valium, which kind of sold Valium as something that everybody should be on all the time, right? So the mother's little helper, um, that's, that, that is him. And, and I mean, you know, a, a huge, huge amount of Valium was, was obviously prescribed in the 1970s. As I already said, it was actually a problem for the National Health Service. Um, it was costing so much money. He then, uh, his, his um, nephew, um, after he died, um, uh, took over Purdue, and, and, and Purdue um, Pharma had some, you know, the family had some serious um, um, economic problems, and so they worked. They wanted to fathom how they could turn their end-of-life painkiller into something that was a mass-market product. Um, and the answer was like, you can't in, in an ethical sense. Like, it, clearly, this is not a painkiller that everyone should be taking. But they flouted. Um, all of that kind of advice and, and knowledge, and and they essentially marketed it as something um, that you know even mild pain um, should um, could be treated by this. They they downplayed and they and they made up scientific papers and they bought off scientists and so on to downplay all of the addictive problems with them. I and mean, they kind of said it's not addictive. Um, uh, they went out and they um, spoke to doctors. I mean, the thing that Sackler was really famous for was recognizing that doctors are who we have trust in in society. So if you can get inside the head of a doctor and you can get the doctor to prescribe something and think this is a good idea, that's way more important than mass marketing to consumers of pharmaceuticals. So they did that 
you know, they kind of corrupted parts of the medical establishment. I mean, we'd take them on holidays and this kind of stuff. And, it, you know, it, it happens often, but it was a big thing with OxyContin, a really big thing. Um, and so huge, huge numbers of Americans were prescribed this stuff by doctors who'd been, you know, talked to or bought off um, uh, by um, Purdue Pharma um, and got addicted extremely quickly. Um, uh, so, you know, I start one of the chapters with the, the great artist Nan Golding, photographer, um, who was addicted, you know, says she was addicted within 48 hours. Wow. To it. Um, it sounds like crack cocaine or something. Well, and there's a great, I mean, if people want, you know, if you've got a Netflix subscription, I mean, Painkiller is, 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 is out now and it, it is the dramatization of, of what happened. Um, and it's, it's shocking. And they start every episode with one of the victim's families who's lost somebody saying, okay, this is a dramatization, but what's not dramatized is the loss I experienced. And you are talking here about huge, I mean, they reckon maybe 300,000 people have died of opioid overdoses. Uh, that, that is not all OxyContin, um, but, but, but much of it started with the overprescription of OxyContin. Much of those addictions started. And I mean, there are whole towns where, you know, kind of half the town was wiped out in certain parts of the United States from this. So it's had an immense impact on the psyche um, of Americans and their attitude towards, towards pharma. Yeah, I didn't really get the scale of it until I was in Canada the year before last. And um, again, that wasn't all oxy. It was you know, a range of opioids, but very different to Europe. And you just walk down, you'd walk down the downtown of, of somewhere like Vancouver. It wasn't Skid Row, but I remember walking down one particular street and I must have seen 1,500 people. And I know, I know British Columbia is quite unique because it has a nicer climate, etc. But it was just, I was like, wow, this would not happen in Europe. You know, you'd be going up a bridge and there'd be two guys taking stuff and it was just all out in the open. And again, I know there's some legal differences with regards to not decriminalization, but trying to get it out in the open, that's obviously good. But there is, it's a pandemic in North America. And, and until then, and I'd only really seen, you know, Donald Trump talk about it or, you know, um, criticism of the Sackler family in particular. But like he says, a mass, mass social phenomenon, it's just, it's inescapable. And the idea that that was driven by lobbyists and one particularly powerful family is just mind-boggling. Yeah, that they knew what they were doing and they did it on purpose because they knew they could make a lot of money out of it. And what are the that consequences? Um, and for so, them? For them, the consequences, I, I mean, after, I mean, the, the, the scale of it is so enormous and there have been such phenomenal campaigning you know, including by Nan Golden's group, um, who's who's gone around and tried to get Sackler's name taken down from you know galleries and museums. Um, you know, so you know, like the um, in, in New York, several galleries have removed um, his name. I think in London, a couple have as well, um, as a result of their direct actions. Um, that's alerted people to the link between this powerful family and what's happening on the streets, like you describe it. Um, and there have been various class actions and cases taken now um, against um, against Purdue um, and against the Sackler family. However, you know, as you would expect, um, the Sacklers are still sitting on huge amounts of money almost all of which was made um, from the sale of OxyContin that they managed to get out of the company. Um, you know, there are examples where they've had to apologize, you know, to the relatives and so on. But I mean, you know, in terms of, in terms of how they continue to live, they live very well. Um, and they live very well off that, that money. Do you watch Ozark? Have you seen Ozark? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think that's, there's a, I won't, spoiler alert for anybody, but you know, there's this, it seems like an overt reference to the Sacklers where they're basically selling, selling rather, you know, tens of millions of dollars of heroin to a, a pharmaceutical company. Do you think that's sort of on the nose and that was the intention to? Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it, and you see it in Painkiller where there's, you know, one, you know, one very ethical doctor kind of runs out after, after one of these kind of young, almost models that they were sending in um, to sell, to, to sell them. And, you know, the most incredible thing for me was the, the cuddly toys, the cuddly, you know, the pills, the Oxycontin pills that they made into cuddly toys um, that were in pharmacies and in doctor surgeries and so on. But I mean, he runs out after her and, and just says, you're a, you're a drug dealer, you're a drug pusher. Um, so yeah, I think it's that, that's, that's what they were doing. Um, and that's an extreme example, but it gives you some idea of the kind of incentives that exist within the medical production system, within the pharmaceutical system, um, to, to push things in a way that is not, it's not in society's interest. It's not in the public interest, what they're doing. It is in the interests of making huge amounts of money. Mm, I mean, you see these 
You see these stories about Duterte, obviously reprehensible man, rounding up drug dealers, blah, blah, blah. And you think, no, these, these people are amateurs compared to the Sacklers. And, it's, uh, and there's a very different outcome. Not that I'm suggesting that Duterte's treatment is ju- justifiable necessarily. On the patents thing, this is really interesting because I, I you know, again, I, I don't know much about this. I just know that pharmaceutical companies make a great deal of money because of patents. But then I look at patent law in the US and it's, I know they continually get them to sort of, they're prolonging them over time, but patents are actually still quite short. So it's about, I think about 20 years, obviously depends where you are. So, but yet there are so many drugs and treatments which appear to be patented, which goes beyond 20 years. So what are we talking about? Marketing rights, names? What what exactly is being patented and for how long? It is partly about the trademarks as well. Of course it is. Um, so it's also about, as I say, you know, many people, when I was young, you know, uh, you, you, you'd never asked for paracetamol, you'd ask for Panadol, you know? So there is something about the name that's also really important. But actually, the patents themselves... Um, very, very often, I would say almost always go on far beyond um, the 20 year term. And the reason for that is the amount of money and investment that these corporations put into what they call evergreening, making very small changes to a drug that means that you can essentially get a new patent. And I mean, a drug won't have one patent anyway. I mean, uh, drugs, individual medicines can have you know, well over 100 patents. They call them patent thickets. They patent all sorts of things. They patent bits of the process. They patent bits of the product. They patent bits of like how you're supposed to um, therapeutically uh, give this um, drug to somebody. So yeah, one of the things they're trying desperately to patent at the moment is is, is magic mushrooms, um, because of course we think they may be very useful in fighting depression. So you know they're trying to patent this natural substance, and one of the things they're doing is saying, well, there's a patent on how you therapeutically need to administer this that you know actually talks about like you know have a comfortable bit of furniture, have soft colours in the room. I mean, crazy stuff, right? right? That gives them that gives them patents. But yeah, they. I mean, the the the, the most ridiculous example I found in researching the book was somebody had literally put a powder tablet into a plastic capsule. I mean, they said you literally, you, you could take the, ca- the plastic capsule and the old tablet kind of fell out, right? So, and and you know, most, most of them do something a bit more than that, but still there is no therapeutic value to what they're doing. And that's really important because that then changes who the pharmaceutical company employs, right? So if what you want is to evergreen something you're already sitting on, then you need lawyers. You don't need scientists. You don't need scientists very much. Um, rather than putting the immense profits you've made into, invent- into inventing a kind of new generation of drugs, you don't want to do that. You essentially want to work out tiny changes so that you can get a new patent and then defend that patent. So the amount of litigation these corporations do is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you've even seen it over the COVID vaccine. So you know, Moderna is now taking Pfizer to court. You know, so it's, it's also been in court against the US government. It's been in court against another. You know, it's just endless because that's how they make the profits, the property rights to produce as opposed to the thing itself that we think they're selling. So the, the whole the whole putting the pill in the capsule how, would that add another twenty years? How, how does the evergreening work? Would it add five years, and then they would have to find it, something it would else? Depend. It would depend. What, it would depend what they did um, and how the regulators um, yeah, accepted or didn't accept um, that this was a genuine um, change to the to the original drug. Um, but yeah, it could do. It could be a whole new um, patent term. It would, it would it would really depend. But I mean, certainly when. Uh, in the US, when congressional committees have looked into this, they found that um, often monopolies last, you know, years and years and years longer than they than they should do. And they've actually calculate they calculate on individual drugs um, the amount that that will have cost individual patients and the economy as a whole um, in terms of overcharging that is allowed to continue um, through that through that period. I mean, there's other stuff as well. They kind of pay off generic companies. You know, pay for delay. They kind of you know pay people off in one way or another so, so they, that they, they won't produce competitive wow. competition. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all the all the kind of um, you know the the old fashioned monopolistic trust practices um, that you hear about from the days of the robber barons. It's all it's 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 their bread and butter today because what they're running more than medical production companies, more than uh, drug invention companies, is monopolies. That's pretty extraordinary. When the patent runs out, they then pay a company not to produce a cheaper version. And we're meant to be saying this is, you know, com- competitive markets, innovation, etc. They're paying people not to innovate. They're paying people not to produce a, a cheaper product, which is apparently what capitalism is meant to be really good at. That's the crazy thing. So there is nothing about the way the pharmaceutical industry works that suggests this is a free market competitive 
economic sector. Absolutely nothing at all. This is this is pure monopoly capitalism with the with 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 the profits to boot. Yeah, I don't like you know you often hear that line. This isn't real capitalism. If only, and it's kind of like I don't like that line, but it's kind of true, right? You know, if you had the the opportunity of generic companies to produce cheap alternatives when those things come to market. The reason why I talk about the patent thing not being clear to me is because of um, the pharma bro, Martin Shkreli. <laughs> so this wasn't clear to me at the time. He um, bought the rights or the patent. You can explain this now, I suppose. You're the best person to answer this question. He bought drugs which were relatively cheap. They were di um, diabetes treatments, I think. There was like insulin treatments. Or I think he bought a few, but the one that people were really upset about was um, was one that treats uh, infection um, in particularly HIV um, patients. Yeah. Um, so it was really important um, for them, and it, yeah, it was it was it was quite cheap. And he increased and he increased the price by like five thousand percent or yeah. whatever, more or less. Yeah. So, so how how was he doing that? Was he then because he wasn't a lawyer? This guy was coming. I think he had an economics background. Um, so how was he doing that? Well, it's it's a great story. I mean, he he came from a hedge fund background. Yeah, you're right. He's he's, he's kind of high finance. And he's got a quote where he says, I, I got out of the hedge fund business because there wasn't enough money to be made in it, right? And the pharmaceuticals is what he identified as. And I mean, he would scour through um, uh, stuff that was, that was going to come off patent soon um, and, and kind of look at what, you know, said drug was, was, was supposed to do and say, right, well, I can, I, can, I can maybe buy that up fairly cheaply because it's not, it's not worth much to the patent holder anymore. And then, I'll, and then I'll jack the price before anybody else has had time to, get in there um, and produce a generic copy. And I'll be able to recoup, you know, thousands of times um, what I've paid for it in that, in that bit. So it was buying and selling. I mean, it was, it was high finance. That's, that's what he saw it as. And the interesting thing about him is, uh, I, I mean, he's a pantomime villain, right? I mean, that's the, I mean he laughed about it. That was mm. the thing. He spent I mean, like $3 million on a Wu-Tang clan album and absolutely stuff, you know? i mean he's the only i mean he's a guy that that managed to unite you know donald trump bernie sanders and hillary clinton in their disdain for this for this guy um but actually i think what's more important and i mean i, I quote people like um, um dermot uh, mcdonald from just treatment in the book saying what he did was not actually that unusual right he what made him unusual was the fact that he bragged about it mm -hmm. and sat there and laughed about it and but you know and was very honest actually i mean read some of the stuff he says and he's like this is my business you know, do you think this isn't how it works? You think this isn't how capitalism works? Um, this is what my shareholders expect of me. But, you know, you see, you see, so he kind of, he, he, he took it along, he took it far, um, but he also laughed about it. And that was what they, they didn't really forgive him for. But it's actually you know, pretty, pretty much how mainstream pharma works. Mm. His mistake was to tweet about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, where do regulators fit in on all of this? Because by the sounds of it, something like the FDA, which is the relevant regulator in the US, I mean, what these people are doing is awful, from the Sacklers to Shkreli to, to Pfizer. But realistically, if you had a robust regulator, they could stop a lot of this, couldn't they? Yes, absolutely they could. Um, unfortunately, the, the regulator in the US is has nowhere near, I mean, the FDA has nowhere near enough power over all sorts of things. And I used to work on, you know, kind of food quality in the US, and you can see it from the types of stuff that big agricultural businesses are allowed to do. Um, they, simply, they simply don't have enough power um, to control um, these these corporations, so they can do stuff on 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 health and safety and so on, but essentially the really big powers um, that were nearly given to them, I think you can argue, in the 1960s as a result of you know, public disquiet, um, never made it through. You know, they were just they were just too powerful. Um, and one of the things I look at in the book is, is how they is how they derive that power, how they fought off the regulators, um, and and there's a whole. You know, there's a whole story on corporate capture. There's a whole story on corrupting the medical profession, on corrupting academia, um, on corrupting the regulators um, themselves in terms of, you know, becoming a partner as opposed to a party um, to be regulated. But there's also this story they told. And the story they told is, OK, you might not like us. We might charge a lot for our drugs. But imagine if you didn't have any drugs. Right. So we are the golden goose and they told and they told politicians a slightly different version of the story which is in the middle of the cold war you know do you really want to risk your competitive advantage with the soviet union um do you really want to risk your competitive advantage with any other country in the world if we're to stay competitive um you need to reward us for the innovation um that we're doing and we are we are you and you are us and we have the same interest and it was a very very successful story that prevented um 
the regulation that was being pushed for by certain people in the Senate and Congress at the time. So, so COVID made that geopolitical aspect to all of this front and centre again. And it's something that which, you know, repeatedly comes through in, in the book is it was the fr- forefront of my mind anyway, obviously because of Russia's occupation of Ukraine or part of it, um, how obviously lots of people in the global south are under no illusions about the global north, multinationals, governments, etc. But many of them weren't expecting what proceeded to happen in terms of how resources resources were allocated with vaccines, therapies, etc. And that really was a sort of last nail in the coffin of the idea of global, global multilateralism and cooperation. You might say, well, that's partly because of Trump or whatever. But there was that sense that, you know, actually the global north aren't even going to give us the slight modicum of, of you know, um, of crumbs from the table that we've we've gotten used to. What changes with sort of the rise of China? So uh, from 45 really to 1990, you know, there's an argument that the worst successes of capitalism, free market capitalism, were sort of filed down because the United States also had to win hearts and minds as well as make profits in, in developing markets. Is that beginning to come back with the rise of China and to a lesser extent India as sort of second to first rate powers? I think it is, most definitely. And I, I think you're absolutely right that it was COVID was a wake up call, and in a world clearly confronting a major crisis in our economic system and our environmental system, you know the question of what we can expect from the global north is is very pertinent to most countries in the world. And I think it wasn't you know it wasn't the kind of the poorest countries that I guess expect to be treated like that. But I think the emerging countries, I think South Africa, I think Brazil, I think they were genuinely taken aback by how they were treated. The fact they were absolutely at the back of the queue. The fact that me and you had booster shots before their frontline workers had got anything at all, I think was genuinely you know it's like okay the mar- we've been told to rely on the market the market's failed us we've been told if not there'll be a bit of charity there was no charity whatsoever we sold them nothing we donated them nothing and then the critical bit we didn't even allow them to make their own right we kept hold of the recipes we refused to allow factories to manufacture we manufactured artificial scarcity so it was a huge wake up call that i think you're right i think has reset how many countries in the world think about international cooperation um, or the lack of it i would say i think there was i think there was the, the the one exception to that i think in europe wasn't a consideration at all we just kind of ignored it i think biden is a bit of an exception and 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 it may be because of domestic reasons that he was already very critical of the way big pharma was operating but i think he saw at a critical moment you know what almost every vaccine available in the global south is now from china or russia what does that say about our soft power going forward? And so my belief, one of the reasons um, he he backed in the end this, this kind of global call um, for a waiver of intellectual property was precisely because he saw they were losing a diplomatic um, battle in the world. This is what really struck me with the whole thing and, and the hypocrisy of how Britain approached COVID and, and global cooperation on vaccines. Our job at Navarra is to point at British politicians and say, hypocrisy, fine. You know, we do it a lot. Often we don't need very much help. But you had Boris Johnson in Cornwall at the G7 saying, Britain is going to lead the way in vaccinating the world. And not only did we not vaccinate the world, and actually the promise he was making was quite small, we were taking vaccines produced in India, ensuring we had them. They were being produced for AstraZeneca in Indian um, in manufacturing facilities. Meanwhile, like you say, we were having our second, third jabs and frontline workers in India weren't even on their first one. And what's worst of all, Nick, is that lots of good people, you know, not like a left-right thing, lots of good people, not just Boris Johnson stalwarts, you know, however many of them or few of them remain, lots of really good people who believe Britain's a really good country, as a force for good in the world, believe this. They genuinely think Britain was helping to vaccinate the world. The stupid, poor global south, they can't help themselves. We were doing the precise opposite. So so where does this, where does this come from, this belief that we're such a force for good in the world, when the, when the facts on something like, for instance, pharmaceuticals in the global south, tell us a completely different story? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, I, you know, it, it is clearly a line that's manufactured by an awful lot of the mainstream media. It's clearly something that politicians like to tell themselves. I mean, none of us really like to believe we're bad people, right? So I'm sure, like, there is a you know, if you can if you can turn the story around in some way to explain why the meager thing that you're doing is 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 actually more than making up for all the um, terrible stuff you do in the world. I mean, I think that's been the story of development for a very long time. To be honest, I think it was the story of development. You know, for for for, for despite the you you know, the significant things that Labour did after 97 um, on development. There was something very disquieting for me about the, the story they were telling, which is by and large, you know, we are good people and this aid is, you know, making life better for you because you can't really manage um, to do that yourself. Yeah, well, which, which manages to completely erase all the money that we actually extract from and the resources we extract from the most of the, most of the world through debt payments and dodgy trade deals and all the rest of it. You know, I think it's I think it's something which which we've told ourselves for a long time. I imagine um, a very similar story was told by the colonial administrators, to be honest. I'm sure many of them thought what they were doing was absolutely reasonable and good and we were bringing them railways, you know. So I think it's something deep in our psyche about that that allows us to kind of over overlook what's what, what we're really doing. But what fascinates me is when people are told a real, the real story, you get a huge amount of support. So, so, so I, you know, I understand that at the very beginning of the pandemic, people were desperate for a vaccine for their elderly relatives or their, you know, family that worked in a hospital or whatever. I understand that it was very unlikely that we were going, ever going to um, fairly distribute across the world the first vaccines that came out of the AstraZeneca factory. I have to accept that. Um, however, when we were on our third shots and we were still selling nothing, we were still donating nothing, and even worse, we weren't allowing them to produce those drugs themselves. I mean, that was the thing. That across the political spectrum, wherever you stood on Brexit, if you voted Labour, Lib Dem or Tory, every, we got a majority on every opinion poll. Of course we should share this stuff so people can produce their own. It was abhorrent to people. And you had a prime minister pretending to do all of this stuff um, while actually defending and being one of the last governments on earth to defend the sanctity of the intellectual property of the pharmaceutical industry. You know, real vested interest stuff. Um, it's, it's shocking. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think, I think one of the reasons that we moved on from that story is you know, covid ended. Well, for most people believe COVID had ended and they wanted to move on from what had been a very difficult period. Um, and part of the point of the book is to keep that conversation going and think, no, we've really got to learn from this. We've really got to look at what happened here. I just think it says so much about British political culture that we did a broadly good job in terms of distributing the vaccine, manufacturing and distributing the vaccine domestically. Britain had a pretty good roll up by global standards. But we just have to, you know, our political class just has to take it too far. Rather than just say that, look, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put our people first, blah, 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 blah. Okay. First of all, a lot of the electorate agrees with that, like you say, to a point. But they just have to say the global leadership thing. It's just, it's just lunacy. And I, I still don't understand why so, so many people buy it. So many people genuinely buy it. They think that we're giving all of that. And it's, it's this bugbear for like the conservative talking points. We're giving all the money away. We're helping all these people. We're not helping ourselves. And it's... I don't understand. It's obviously clearly striking a really powerful chord with people for some reason. I don't quite get it. You know, we're the, we're the victims in all this. And you're right about that. So it was so partly the AstraZeneca uh, uh, vaccines that, that weren't being produced um, quickly enough because of problems with European manufacturing, which we found out about later. Um, so we were saying we were still a priority customer, even for the ones that were coming out of India, of the Serum Institute, which was the only factory at that time. I think it was still the only factory that, 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 that knowledge had been shared with. They were the only Western vaccines that were available for the global South at the time. And we took five to 10 million, even as India was going into that horrific wave, you know, that horror film that we watched unfolding on TV, we were still trying to get five million doses out of them. We also tried to get 200,000 Pfizer doses out of COVAX, right? Co COVAX, which had been set up purposefully for the fair distribution um, of drugs around the world. We took 200,000 of them, like while we were still the best, pretty much the best provision country in terms of vaccine doses in the world. You know, nobody else had mRNA vaccine. You know, virtually no one else in the world, no other country had them. And we took them. It That's was crazy. extraordinary. We're vaccinating the world, but we're going to take COVAX, which, like you say, is this initiative that starts in, what, January 2020 at um, Davos. Yeah, Davos yeah. You know, how can we help the world's poorest unvaccinated people? You talked about development a moment ago. Uh, in the book, you talk about a development establishment who are these people that constitute the development establishment? 
I mean, there are people who've, who've, you know, for, for, I would say from the late 90s on, there was, there, there, there was kind of a shift in thinking um, amongst political elites in, in the West um, that, OK, we, we've had kind of really rapacious Thatcherism slash neoliberalism. Um, and um, it's caused like actually quite a lot of poverty around the world. Um, and, you know, that is a bit of a problem. Um Apart from anything else, because if you want to create markets in other places around the world, um, you can't do that with these levels of deprivation. You know, it's just impossible for states to kind of function. Um, so you know, the development industry kind of you know emerged from that, and it, you know it, 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 a degree of popular consent was built, particularly around you know I guess in this country the Ethiopian famine in 1984, um, and before you knew it, you know this had become like quite uh, quite mainstream. Uh, it was accepted by the political classes. And a- out of that emerged, you know, some really huge organizations with really very well-paid people who were very well politically connected, who tend to see the world from the perspective of political elites as opposed to the people that they're supposed to be serving, if indeed that's how they view their jobs, you know, they're serving the interests of people in the global south and so on. Um, and, and so here, you know, as you say, in Davos of all places, you know, capitalism's away day, you have these, you have these two figures, uh, one of whom runs um, uh, Gavi and one of whom runs Sepi. I mean, they're, they're basically you know, philanthropic organizations that are, that, are, that are set up to deal with the fact that actually the market cannot get medicines to the majority of people in the world, particularly the poorest in the world. So, I mean, there is an acceptance there the market doesn't really work, so we'll help it work a little bit better. We'll do mass purchasing and stuff like that and make sure it gets where it's needed to go. But, I mean, these people are within their own rights, you know, part of the political elite. They move within those circles and they see things from their perspective. And so, in a sense, their job is about trying to ease the consequences of neoliberalism without challenging the fundamental structures of neoliberalism. And I mean, that's the, you know, the thinking of Bill Gates is absolutely symptomatic of that. You know, he's the world's richest man. He, he, he believes in the market. He believes in intellectual property. It's how he's made his money. Uh, but he, you know, he's troubled by the fact there's a lot of poverty in the world. Surely we can, we can alleviate some of that without touching the system that made me very wealthy. So, so, so do you think that now in, in 2023, the idea of, of development is sort of, inextricably linked to billionaire philanthropy because it, it, it didn't feel like that in say the late 1990s or even things like make poverty history 2005 that was very much you know, everybody can help wear your little make poverty history band that's very different to where we are now which is yeah bill clinton or or bill gates saying that actually you know billionaires can can solve some of the world's problems. Yeah, I mean, look, my, my organization used to be called the World Development Movement, right? We, we used to think development was a good thing. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's authors like Yash Tandon who describe development as a, as a kind of liberation of a people from um, the rule of the market and from the rule of oppressive government. That's what development was supposed to be. I think, I, yeah, I absolutely think that in the, in the, in the late 90s, 2000s, that, that kind of warped into something um, that, that was more often than not negative. I mean, more often than not, when you'd, when, you'd, when you'd go and speak to people who were being affected by development, or who development was being done to, it was like, actually, this is something, you know, we don't want. This is, this is a, a, a mega project, which is likely to make somebody an awful lot of money um, while completely transforming our lives in a way that we don't want. And I mean, you know, I, you know, I, my big political awakening was the anti-globalization movement, which, of course, was sparked by the Zapatistas um, in, in Chiapas, in the, in the south of Mexico. And they were, abs- they were rising up against the North American free trade agreement and the North American free trade agreement was supposed to bring you all these jobs and all this development and this is going to be wonderful and they said we don't want that we don't want that like we like our lives are poor and we don't want to be poor um, but we certainly don't want to go and have to like sew clothes in sweatshops along the United States border so that idea of development I think yeah I think to some degree became a became a dirty word I hope the Daily Mail don't get hold of this book by the way because there is um there's a few great anecdotes about British development aid going to uh, people that offer plastic surgery and like mm-hmm. in India or, you know, South America. And I, because I, I, I did an interview with Matt Kennard recently, and I've, I've always had, I've been a skeptic of aid. Uh, 
Um, not stuff like, you know, reproductive health or access to water, but some of the big projects which the government gets involved in. And he was talking about like, you know, business parks in Southeast Asia and we'd help build a five-star hotel because if you build a five-star hotel, it means that they'll have rising per capita GDP and that must be good. And you think, why is the taxpayer paying for a five-star hotel the other side of the planet? Uh, but this builds on that, you know, you really talk about British aid being used to push an agenda of private health care in some of the world's poorest countries. And I find that really remarkable because you have politicians at home saying the NHS will always be free. The same politicians will say we're so virtuous because we want to help people in the global south. They're using the money which is meant to help people in the global south to have private, not public health care. Yeah, absolutely. So there's an example that, that I give in the book of this, you know, uh, I, I call it the, the hospital that became a trading floor, you know, where a, a WhatsApp conversation was, and this, this had had British aid, it had had World Bank aid and so on. Um, and essentially, you know, they were they were running it like they were on a trading floor. They were saying, you know, we need every bed occupied. They were giving people unnecessary treatments. Um, they were holding uh, babies and ill people hostage until fees were paid. I mean, crazy stuff right and i and i and we're helping fund them and we're helping fund it right so i mean i agree with you but I, this this is this is p- part and parcel of the problem for me and i think you know while i'm while i firmly believe in redistribution of wealth both within this country and on a global level you can't stand by um, and watch aid money be used in a way which essentially says you know, develop there is no difference there's no distinction between development and capitalism Right. Development becomes the development of capitalism. And, and, and because we ideologically believe capitalism is good and is going to provide all things to all people, of course that's what we're going to spend aid money trying to do. Now, you can't stand by and kind of watch the perversion of this thing. And I mean, personally, I think you know, the, the, the era of aid is over, which is not to say um, that I think you know, I would support um, the government in, in cutting important programs, but I think we've got to fundamentally... Um, Revisualize what we mean by development, what we mean by redistribution of wealth in the world, um, because we cannot go on, you know, with this kind of neo-colonial mindset, thinking, ah, this is our little bit of charity. This is doing good stuff to people who, you know, can't manage themselves. Like I said earlier, um, there are there are there are there are much more kind of grown-up and modern ways um, to redistribute wealth. We don't think about health in this country by saying the rich should offer a bit of charity to the poor um, because otherwise, you know, they'll get ill and die. We think of it as a universal system and the redistribution of our taxes is how it's funded. I think we've got to think about similar things on, a, on an international level. See, a lot of people in the, in the centre, or not in the centre, a lot of liberals would say that's a right wing talking point to criticise aid. <clears throat> what would you say to them? I would say aid has been what we originally wanted when we campaign for the aid budget, has been has been so perverted uh, that very often it's doing the very opposite of what we wanted it to do. And you can't stand by when a, when a, when a model has been taken from you and used for completely different ends and say, yeah, we we continue to support it. Of course you can't, or you're complicit. You know, given we were the, we were yeah, my organisation was one of the organisations campaigning for this budget. You know, we would be complicit. Um, in the in the perversion of that budget, if we just stood by and said nothing about it. So as I said, I'm not saying every penny of aid is spent wrongly, not at all, and I'm not supporting um, I'm not supporting um, um, cutting aid um, because some of it is 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 used very well. Um, but the bits that aren't used well, and the funny thing is, of course, the bits that aren't used well are precisely the bits that remain in place through all of the through all of the aid cuts. And that's because, you know, a conservative government for 13 years has seen this budget as something where they can, you know, give a bit of money back to big business, you know, support a huge amount of money that goes to the big accountancy firms yeah. um, to advise developing countries on how they can develop a more marketized economy. Yeah. I mean, we can't possibly stand by and, and, and allow that to happen. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to do that without feeding a nasty kind of racist right wing narrative that says, you know, those people will never do anything useful with their, <laughs> with their, with their lives or their country. It should be nothing to do with us. Um, but at the same time, I think we've got it. I think it's the time now where we've got to begin fighting for something else. It, it's an interesting one with aid because it feels like conservatives like it or a certain kind of aid like you say because it can be market oriented it can be how to get influence you know british um business interests overseas can benefit from it british businesses here that build projects overseas can benefit from it then you've got liberals who like they feel good about it in a normative sense because we're a force for good in the world 
And, and then there, there is a really powerful left critique of both of those, but we don't really hear it anywhere nearly enough. You, you, you actually paint a really vivid picture of a man in India, I can't remember his precise name, who in the midst of COVID, I think it was maybe Omicron, or maybe it was before then, but he basically couldn't get into a private hospital because they were saying, you know, this is going to be minimum three days and it's going to be circa a thousand dollars and his families didn't have the money. And then he goes into one of these hospitals he dies and they, they can't get his body back. Yep. Unless they pay the astronomical amount of money. And, and, these, and, and these are hospitals supported with, with British aid money. But I mean, it's not just us. I mean, Oxfam has done a brilliant report called Sick Development just a few weeks ago where they, where they highlighted many of these cases and went into more details than I've done. Um, I think there is, a, there is an understanding and a reckoning um, that that moment, that 90s moment where, you know, international development was, was, became a thing, we funded it, um, that has passed. And there were some problems with it. I mean, let's not forget. And I, you know, I'm I'm actually quite a fan in many ways of of what you know a minister like Claire Short did um, with with Diffid. However, but there were problems with it. Um, you know, they were they were obsessed with doing free trade deals with everyone, you know, every country on earth. Um, they were obsessed with marketizing people's economies and so on. And that often did way more damage than the aid that we were giving. But the aid we were giving allowed us to continue feeling good about the relationship we had with those people. Um, actually, it would have been much better if we'd stopped doing all of the bad stuff that we were doing. Yeah, well, including pharmaceuticals. On the a final point on this, you know, I think it was, um, I think it was the Cottonau Agreement, I think, which is about EU sub-Saharan African, primarily sub-Saharan African countries, trade agreements. And at the time, I think the EU trade commissioner was one Peter Mandelson, I think. And, you know, th there was a very clear tying of trade and aid, um, you know, overtly. Uh, and like you say, it was quite obvious that the, the, the changes to the trade environment were far more injurious than what they were getting in aid. But you know, we don't really have that conversation in this country. Um, going back to pharmaceutical companies, you have this incredible sort of fact where you say that big pharma companies, they, they pay out more in a year than they make in profit. So how is that possible? Good question. It sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? So um, in, in a, what I would call a, a very financialized um, company, you know, you, you're essentially living on debt. You know, and you hope that debt will pay off and you'll, you'll get enough leverage at the end of the day. But essentially, they've turned their companies into cash machines, massively extractive models um, to suck money out of the company itself and hand it to your investors, to your shareholders, who you depend upon to keep investing in your company so you can keep going. You know, it's all a big, all a big circle and, and maybe a house of cards sometimes. And so what that means is that these companies every year hand, I mean, in the case of pharmaceutical companies, almost always hand way more over to their shareholders than they spend on research and development. But, but, but often, as you say, in, in, in some cases, hand more over even than they've made in that year in, in, terms, of, in terms of net profits. So they're kind, and, they, and they do it by using debt and so on. But what, they, what they're ultimately doing long term is kind of hollowing out those companies, hollowing out those companies' ability to be useful players in society. And I would argue it's not just pharmaceutical companies, but they're a particularly good example of it. But I mean, people like Richard Murphy have done, you know, just some, some great papers with the University of Sheffield, looking at the economy as a whole, and how it's becoming just so much more fragile, so much less productive, um, so much more crisis prone, because this is, this is common behavior now. The company exists and the point of the company is to maximize shareholder returns, whatever the cost, whatever the cost, even to the long-term sustainability of the company in some cases. Do you understand where vaccine skeptics came from with regards to the credibility of these pharmaceutical companies? I don't say you agree with their conclusions, but you can at least understand their rationale because you've already said, you know, a senior person in Pfizer, was that, it's probably a big word, was misrepresenting AstraZeneca um, if a journalist did that, it would be called fake news, I think, frankly. Um, you had senior people in, in big pharma companies benefiting to an extraordinary extent from announcements with regards to vaccines when, you know, people say in the book, you know, if you reach this certain level with regards to tests and trials, great, but you wouldn't publicly declare anything because it's not, you know, it's not um, conclusive people would be doing that and then senior people in a, in a pharma company would be making millions, tens, hundreds of millions as a result of their increase in stock value. You know, there was a clear relationship between public communications, PR, 
and certain individuals benefiting to an extraordinary extent. You know, some billionaires were made in this process. So given all of that, can you understand where people come from when they say, well, you know what, I don't believe these companies and therefore that leads to vaccine skepticism? Yeah, well, it certainly doesn't help, does it? Yeah, absolutely. And and there are cases in there, or you know, there's one case from from Nigeria where there was a meningitis outbreak, and you know, a company came in, can't remember which one now, and 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 just was awful, really. It was experimenting on on kind of kids, um, and and didn't behave in a way that would even be allowed here. That part of Nigeria. 20 years later, is still highly sceptical of any medicines that come from the West. Not surprising. Um, and, and yes, I, I absolutely think so. I mean, I think you can even argue that these companies had an incentive um, to um, not make their vaccines more effective, right? I mean, it was very good for them that we had to take third and fourth doses and so on. Now, I don't, I'm not saying there was any decision to do that within the companies, but you know, it worked for them. So of course, I can understand why um, there was a degree of scepticism on the part of the public. I think vaccine scepticism is quite interesting. I mean, it, go, it goes back right to the beginning of vaccines. Uh, you know, it goes back to cowpox and, and smallpox and people being worried that they were being injected with a, with a live virus. It's understandable. It's an understandable thing to be scared about. Um, and, and actually has, was, was quite big on the left. I think it was, it was in one of the early, if not the earliest, Labour Party manifesto. There was a degree of vaccine scepticism expressed in there. Um, so, I, you know, of course I can, of course I can understand that. Um, I think in COVID, it was taken to a whole new level. And I think some of that was clearly being driven by... You know, political forces, you know, some of the Trumpist forces in the United States and so on, that, that just took it you know, into the stratosphere. And, and it was quite it was quite frightening. Um, but yes, of course, given the way these companies behave, given what was being asked of us, you know, in terms of individuals in society at that time, citizens in society, you know, I mean, the, 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 the restrictions that were imposed on us were the most authoritarian that have ever been imposed in my lifetime. Um, you know, I'm not saying they weren't necessary, but it deserved questioning at the very least. Um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's ideal ground for those kind of mm. theories to spread. But you know, as I say in there, we we would be helped enormously in trying to defeat those ideas if medicines were produced in a way where it was clearly for the in the common good for the public interest, um, where there was transparency and openness. I mean, there was none of that. I was on a, a press conference yesterday with some of my, you know, some of the friends from South Africa who've just had their COVID contracts released, the, re the, the, the details of the contracts between the South African government and the pharmaceutical companies. And they're completely one-sided, as you'd expect. We still haven't seen ours, right? They're highly redacted, the stuff that we've seen between the British government and AstraZeneca. I mean, that's bound to fuel suspicion. Mm. These things were developed with phenomenal amounts of public money, phenomenal amounts of public money was being handed over to pharmaceutical corporations in whose, um, in whose trust we put our lives, um, that should be public, in publicly accessible information. Yeah, it's this idea of a lack of accountability, transparency, I think it inevitably leads to conspiracy theories. And I think the default way that the modus operandi of Big Pharma, I think, will make this it's the future. It seems to me, you know, a good analog here is um, Prince Andrew. Might be a strange, you know, jumping off point, but you know, you recently had a biographers trying to write a biography of Prince Andrew, and the government said, well, actually, his uh, work that he was doing, two thousand and one to two thousand and eleven, those documents won't be publicly available until twenty sixty five. Now, maybe there's nothing there of any interest whatsoever, you know, or maybe it's just very underwhelming, or maybe there's some bad stuff, but not that bad. But the point is, if you if you're a conspiracy theorist, I mean, that is that is fuel to the fire. And I, 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 it does frustrate me when people in media and politics say, well, these people are conspiracy theorists, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you have the experience of OxyContin, if you have the experience of senior executives in a drug company lying about another drug company to help their own bottom line, it's not wholly irrational. Uh, and I think, you know, I think that connection between big pharma and conspiracy theories is kind of indivisible because... It's interesting, isn't it, when you listen to sort of the US right, and they have a critique of big pharma too, you know, and there's what's really interesting, Nick, I don't know what your thoughts about this are, is that there's lots of sort of US Republicans, not quite Trump supporters, but you know, Trump sympathetic, they might like uh, the, the new guy Vivek or something. And they say that, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies are still allowed to advertise in the United States. It's one of the only countries in the world where big pharma is allowed to advertise, and they have a really big critique of that. And it's one of those things where you think probably the left and right would actually agree on that. You know, it's a rare point of confluence. I, I think pharmaceutical companies in the US are so unpopular for such good reasons 
you know, I mean, opioid crisis, most obvious, but but actually just the way that they, uh, the rapacious way that they treat American citizens, um, that there is, a gr- you know, almost a consensus now mm-hmm. across the political spectrum that something needs to be done um, about their power. Um, and, and and what I would like to try and achieve, what I'm trying to achieve here is, of course, you can you can view it as a bunch of evil people who meet up in rooms to, um, you know, to, 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 get one over on society but actually it's you know it you don't need to believe that because the system the system is as bad as that really the intentions of the individuals involved doesn't really matter okay you know you may get someone like you know Sackler you know who who is who is who is a particular sociopath um when it comes to the marketing of of of, of oxycontin but essentially it doesn't matter how nice a guy you are the incentives built into the system are going to produce these ends whatever otherwise you're not going to keep your job you're not going to get your job in the first place Mm. Mm, that's very well argued in the book. Um, what's the next global health disaster? Given the context of, of Big Pharma, you said there's not much investment, for instance, in antibiotics. There were some people who saw COVID on the horizon before 2020. So a little bit of crystal ball gla- gazing. What would you, um, what would you say is the, is the big threat in the 2030s, 2040s? Um, antibiotics are absolutely going to be one of them. You know, antibiotics, look, we've overused them. We know that. Uh, now, including in animal feed and so on, um, uh, they're becoming less effective. But the, the big problem that's really never spoken about um, is that the pharmaceutical industry is not investing in any new antibiotics. And they're not investing because essentially anything that they, that, that they discover now is going to be a you know, second, third generation antibiotic. So you're not going to get it unless everything else has failed. Right? So it, you know, that is not going to make you much money in the next 20 years, essentially. So they have no interest in it. Despite the fact that the public has come up with numerous incentives for them to invest in this kind of stuff, they're still not doing it. So, I mean, the guy I quote in the book is, is Jim O'Neill, right? So he was a, he was a, a you know, head of Goldman Sachs investment division. He coined the term BRICS. Um, he was a Tory lord. I think he's now in, 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 in advising Keir Starmer on um, business strategy and so on. Uh, I mean, he really tried to get them to invest in antibiotics. He said, look, you could be looking at tens of millions of people dying um, by 2050, um, because they're completely resistant to antibiotics. You know, very basic stuff like um, cesareans, like some cancer treatments or whatever, will no longer be possible. Our entire medical knowledge depends on this drug, and yet you're doing nothing. Five years ago, you said you'd do something. You've still done nothing. Frankly, I just think you need to nationalise parts of this industry. Mm-hmm. This is a Goldman Sachs bigwig, former Tory Lord, saying that. Yeah. You know, it's really serious. Um, and you know. The same thing could apply to all manner of, 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 of potential pandemics. I haven't got a crystal ball, so I don't know. Obviously, I don't know what the next epidemic is going to be. But COVID didn't come out of nowhere. We had some warnings. Um, and I think the way we live in the world, the relentless um, gobbling up of the, of, the, of the planet and natural spaces uh, by capitalism is, is bound to bring us into increasing you know, conflict with, with, with the natural world and so on. I don't know where COVID came from, but it, it, it would not be a surprise if the next pandemic um, comes from, um, you know, that, the, the, the way that we live. Um, and yet the pharmaceutical industry isn't able to, um, to deal with it at all, which is why I think it's a really interesting time to be doing all of this, because I think that the model itself is not sustainable. And I think that's been proved not just for the majority of the world who live in the global south. I think in the heart of capitalism in the United States, it's been proved. Um, that this model is not fit for purpose. Yeah, I, I think what the whole book really gets to the heart of is, you know, the idea, when you think about it, the, the idea that the research agenda, the global research agenda, and of course not the global research agenda, you have outliers like Cuba or whatever, but broadly speaking, when it comes to real capital allocation, it's the big global North countries, the global research agenda is driven by the market. And it should it shouldn't be, because like you said, things such as, antibiotics. And I, I think, you know, I don't know what your, your views are on this. I know, for instance, something like Andreas Mann would say, you know, the possibility of an Ebola style virus where you have 50% fatality with the transmission of or the transmissibility of a COVID-19, highly unlikely, but not, not, impo- you know, not, not impossible. And it does feel like you probably should be allocating resources to uh, to, to, to be able to address stuff like that. And it's, it's something I've had repeatedly in the last couple of years. People say, we know, and I, I always used to think this, you know, the Neolithic revolution, agriculture, it was a good thing. It let humans engage with the planet in a fundamentally different way. I, I now think the answer is, 
it's too soon to tell. You know, if you did if you did have a virus which knocked out 80, 90 percent of the planet's population, well then, I mean, then you know, then the the jury would be out. And the fact that we have the smartest minds with regards to global healthcare not thinking in those terms is deeply troubling. Yeah, yeah. and even when we did so, when that research is done, it is done by the public sector. Whether it gets taken up or not depends on the pharmaceutical corporations. There's, a, there's an example in there of, you know, Pfizer was so busy doing mergers and acquisitions and whatever and taking over companies. There was a really important drug that could have saved a lot of lives. It's just sitting on a shelf for years and years and years. What, what, I can't remember what the drug was, was, was called now, but, it, you know, it came out in this big article in um, Science. Yeah. Um, and um, it was, there were some researchers looking into it and they kind of identified this and it, it forced them to go back and actually have a look at this drug. And it was like, oh, this is absolutely amazing. Uh, I mean, it could have been a form of breast cancer, I think, that it was effective against. Anyway, um, it's, you know, it, it's and, and I've spoken to, to people who, you know, they wanted to devote their lives to go into science, to research stuff, to make people's lives better. And they left and they became campaigners, actually, because they said what I realized was it didn't matter how important the research I was doing was. All that mattered is, does a big corporation think they're going to make a lot of money out of this? Even the great work that some small biotech companies do. Their only business model is, can I get bought out by a big pharma giant? So you have a completely unbalanced economic sector, which just sucks public funding in, um, privatizes it, encloses that knowledge. And I think this is really interesting beyond pharma, right? We're supposed to live in a knowledge economy, yet we actually have, through the intellectual property system, um, something that's more reminiscent of feudalism, mm. that takes and encloses that knowledge and keeps it out of the hands of the majority of people. It prevents collaboration, but it also means a massive transfer of wealth from the global south to the global north, from workers to capital. Um, and that's a huge problem for inequality. Um, it's a huge problem for how we deal with climate change. Um, so liberating that knowledge is, is, I think, you know, an absolutely central task for those of us on the left. Mm, I think this is very much an uh, industry at the forefront of it. Final question. What's the solution to all of this? So it, it does sound like you probably would need a publicly owned pharmaceutical company in several global North countries as a as a first step. Am I right about that? And what else what else would help? Yeah, uh, you, you definitely would, and in some South countries too. Um, and and I think there are steps. I mean, look, one of the most exciting things for me is you know, insulin production in California from public factories. I mean, that's not only on the agenda; they're building it, they're starting it. Right? They're not accepting pharma ripping them off anymore. They're just saying we have to have, have a public factory to produce this stuff. Really exciting. Incredible that after COVID, the Tory government actually sold off our public vaccine production facility. Um, we absolutely need it. You absolutely need public um, production because for an industry that is no longer that interested in its factories or its staff or even its research per se, um, you cannot allow them to have the stranglehold on that productive capacity or you end up in a COVID situation again. So that's important. But I think also a radically different intellectual property system that says if public money has gone into this, we will not allow this to simply be sold and enclosed. And you could imagine, I mean, Commonwealth's done some brilliant work actually looking at what that could look like and how you could license that um, those rights um, on a different bases depending on whether you're licensing to the public or a small company or a big company. Um, but I think that's got to happen and it's got to go um, beyond pharmaceuticals. Um, and again, I mean, some really exciting stuff. So in South Africa, during the, the pandemic, a bunch of scientists got together, South African government backed by the WHO and just said, we want mRNA vaccines. mRNA is, is a revolutionary technology potentially, goes way beyond COVID. You know, you, you talk about HIV uh, cures, TB cures. Um, we, want, we want a hold on this. They asked Pfizer and Moderna to help. No, guess what? No, not, I'm not interested in helping you. And they kind of cracked it. And they've that they know how to make an, an mRNA vaccine now. They think they may even have a TB vaccine and they are sharing it freely with countries around the world. So it's already starting to break down, um, but the public sector is going to have to be more forceful about what it did. I'm not saying never work with the private sector, but let's be really clear what the terms of that relationship are. And I think that's a really key thing for an incoming Labour government, you know, the Labour, gov the, the, the Labour Party at the moment you know, claims to be very inspired by Mariana Masakatu and some of the stuff she said about industrial strategy. I don't think they fully get it. You know, the point here is not setting up a load of public private partnerships and producing and, 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 and you know, pushing a load of corporate welfare into the, the, the pockets of these corporations that are simply going to hand it over to shareholders. It's about using public 
might public capacity, public planning to restructure the economy in a way that meets the public interest. And I think there's no better way to start than, than medicines. Nick, we'll finish there. Thank you so much for joining us on Downstream. Pleasure.